I'm going to start to read verses 16 through 21. That's Acts 17, verses 16 through 21. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputing he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be set or forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherefore thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we could gather together in your word. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us all this very evening, Lord, that you would help me through this text, Lord, and that your truth will come through, Lord. Please help us and encourage us, Lord, to be more faithful to live for you according to your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the text, we find Paul in Athens. And he, Silas, and Timothy, as we've been going through this over the last past few weeks, they had journeyed through Thessalonica where they faithfully preached the gospel. And the result was what? That the Lord saved many. However, we also see that the unbelieving Jews stirred up the lewd people of the city and caused a riot seeking to do them harm. And those who believed hid Paul and Silas and Timothy and helped them to escape. Then they went by night unto Berea, and there they went straight into the synagogue and preached unto the Jews. And the Bible tells us in Acts 17, verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And the result we find in verse 12, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So the Lord is continuing to do his work to save people by the faithful preaching of the gospel. But, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? There always seems to be a but. The next verse tells us, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither, thither also and stirred up the people. And as we have seen through all of the book of Acts, the gospel is proclaimed by God's faithful servants. The Lord saves all that he intends to, and those he does not, many times these people become hostile. Gospel preaching, even to this day, can be very difficult, and sometimes we see people become very hostile to the gospel. That's because the true gospel, as we said this many times before, the true gospel, not a false gospel, the true gospel becomes personal to everyone that hears it. Because why? Well, first of all, it tells you you're no good. You're a sinner. And second, it not only tells you that you're a sinner, what else does it tell you? You're on your way to eternal destruction. Now, you stop right there and you say, well, wait a second, the gospel actually says that? I, I thought the gospel was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, why did he die? Because you are a sinner and you're on your way to hell. See, there's context that goes with the gospel. So it becomes personal and it can become very offensive to someone. Not only are you a sinner, not only are you on your way to hell, and here's the horrible thing that people hate many times, because people might recognize the first two. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I don't do everything that I'm supposed to do. And yes, I know there is a hell. However, I'm doing everything I can, and I hope that I wind up in heaven. But here's the third reality of the gospel. There is absolutely nothing that you can do about it. There's nothing. You see now why it could garner such hostility in people? 
And the fact is that there is only one true way of escape. That is our Lord Jesus Christ, and that we must repent and believe the gospel. You must believe that the reason he died was for your sins, that he, bar- he was buried and rose again on the third day as proof that God has accepted this sacrifice on behalf of you. And it's not by man's work. He is powerless. It's not by man's faith, will, or intellect, for he is dead in his trespasses and sins. It will take a miracle from God himself. That's the reality of the gospel. He will have to give you the ability to repent. He will have to give you the faith to believe. If God quickens you, he will humble you, and you will respond happily to the gospel. And the fact, the gospel will be the best thing that you've ever heard. It will be the best thing that's ever happened to you. And you will live in such a manner. But if God does not quicken you, then you will not believe. And you will either become indifferent or sometimes hostile because the gospel attacks the deep-rooted pride that all people have at their core. Now, this could cost us in many ways. Friends, families not wanting anything to do with us, not being invited to certain things. It can mean that certain work associates or people at your work, they want nothing to do with you. People might label you as crazy, peculiar, strange. And sometimes people will actually become hostile and want to do you harm. This is the reality of life. And this is really the reality of being a minister of reconciliation. Nonetheless, we are ambassadors for Christ. This is a Christian's goal in life. We are here to make Jesus known to the beautiful gospel of reconciliation. And in this is actually the main message here in our text. And it begs a question. I want you to consider this. Consider this because I think everything we're going to see in the rest of this chapter centers around this one question. And here is the question I have for you. How do you or how do we confront a culture that is steeped in idolatry and might be offended by the true gospel? How do you impact people with the gospel? And I think as we go through this, it will be very instructive for us. It's a relevant question because we have seen through the years the church has struggled with this question. This is a major struggle in the church today. We have seen it in the world that we live in. And what's so amazing to me, it's not only that we have seen the church answer this question wrong. Here's the most interesting thing that I can't even understand. That when they answer that question wrong as far as how do we impact a culture that's steeped in idolatry, guess what text they use? Acts 17. So it's very important for us to rightly divide the word here. What the church has done over the past 150 years and continues to progress down this arid path is to take the gospel and make it less offensive, to soften the edges, if you will. And they have tried to tell people that the gospel is all about you. It's about you becoming more socially accepted. It's about you maybe becoming more healthy or wealthy. It's about having everything you could ever dream of. It's about God wanting you to just be you and fulfill the desires of your heart. It's about you going to church and being entertained. It's about you hearing good music that when you close your eyes and you sway back and forth, you're moved emotionally and somehow you felt like I really worship today. It's about you getting a motivational message to feel better about yourself. It's about you spending a couple of minutes to say a prayer and and getting a guarantee that you will never have to be accountable for your sins anymore and then you could go from there and live any way you want. It's about you not feeling offended. It's about taking what is pleasing about your idolatrous culture and adding a little Jesus to it. Just a pinch of Jesus. Not too much. Because too much will do what? It'll offend you. Too much 
will be perceived to the world as something they don't want. And the church has adopted the ungodly culture of this world and brought it into the church so that people will like church. They will like Jesus. You see that in so-called contemporary Christian music. You see it in the movies. You see it in the, the pews. And the core of the problem is this. The church, for the most part, has the power to save unbelievers with men and not God. That's the problem. They're putting the power in themselves. And because man is not capable of miracles, especially, listen to this, the miracle of salvation. I don't care how many preachers might get up to you, come up in a pulpit and say to you, I've saved 15 people this last week. He saved no one. He has no power. I don't care how many notches he has in his Bible. He is incapable. He has no power to change the hearts of men. So what must he do? He must resort to worldly means. He must make the gospel, the church, Christianity, more palatable, uh, uh, palatable for the heathen. He must show them that the church is just like them. We like ungodly music too. We like ungodly entertainment too. We like partying too. Won't you please give Jesus a try? Honestly, this craziness wants, makes me want to puke. It, you don't find it in Scripture. And what's so interesting to me, many so-called evangelical Christians might be quick to point out to you that, hey, you know, the Catholic religion is an error. And they might even know why. They might even have gone back and seen, like, well, we know why. Because in the 4th century, you know what the Catholics did? That They took the world and the pagan culture around them. And what did they do? They melded it with Christianity. And so we, 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 it's okay to pray to the queen of heaven. It's okay to have all these different gods. Oops, I'm sorry. I mean all these different saint, saints and statutes and pray to them because they all have different kinds of powers. And they look at that and they say, wow, you know what that's called? That's called syncretism. I want us to pause for a second and take a hard look at the modern church today. Are they not doing the same thing with the culture? They absolutely are. I want us to see that there is a difference. There is a difference the way that Paul is now going to go out and witness when he beholds the idolatry that's around him. And as Paul is separated from the rest of the missionary team, because the unbelieving Jews, like I said, from Thessalonica, found out where they were in Berea, and they're looking to kill him, so now he's forced to flee. And it says here in verse 14 and 15, And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and received a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for them to, for to come to him with all speed. They departed. So in our text this evening, we see Paul waiting, waiting for the rest of them, right? Waiting for Silas, waiting for Timothy. He might be laying low. He's, he's a wanted man. And, and as he's waiting for them, Paul confronts a culture that is trenched in idolatry. It's dripping with idolatry. And now he witnesses to them. And, and we see that Paul answers the question, how do we confront a culture that is steeped in idolatry? Let's look at verse 16. It says this, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Uh, now again, let's just stop for a second. We need to understand context here for a second. As some of you might remember from schooling or your education, Athens at this time was a pretty incredible place for a few reasons, right? It was known for its art. It was known for its architecture. It was known for its scientific developments, its mathematical algorithms, its sports. It was high culture everywhere you looked. Sounds like the US in some ways, in some regards, right? It was also known for its renowned philosophy and some of the most famous philosophers who had who had been in, in that area. And, and something else that was so pervasive, it's pagan idolatry. 
When we think of Athens, many times we think of Greek mythology. In fact, their worship to a multitude of deities, it was superseded everything else that we know about that culture. The famous pagan writer Petronius once said, it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. What an indictment, right? And here Paul is in the midst of this overwhelming city with all this culture around him. And as Paul observes the spectacular scene, he is, is he swayed by the marvel of Athens? Is he like, wow, this is incredible, this is great. What does verse 16 tell us? His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Paul sees the city given over to idolatry, and, and, and I wonder what Paul would say of the United States if he lived now and he traveled here. Would he say the same thing? you got to wonder. And it tells us that his spirit was stirred in him. The word stirred here is a Greek word, which means to be provoked to scorn or to burn with anger. I think this is the first thing that really is the differentiating factor between the true gospel ministry and what we find in the church culture today. See, Paul looks at this idolatrous culture of Athens and he's provoked to anger. He is sickened by what he sees. He is undone. He clearly sees the ungodly wickedness and he has a visceral reaction to the sinful behavior. See, the sad thing is that most Christianity today looks at the wickedness and the worldliness of this culture that we live in, and instead of being provoked to scorn, they look what they, at what they see, and, and they like it. They actually like it. See, this is, one of the, this is the number one fundamental problem that we see in the church today. It's not scorn to anger that, I can't believe that movie. I can't believe that song. I can't believe the way people are dressed and how they behave. No, the church today looks at it and says, how can we be more like that? And truth be told, that's why we have heavy metal Christian music. That's why we have you know, churches, so-called churches, playing ACDC Highway to Hell on an Easter service. That's why we have preachers who do sermons on Star Wars or Spider-Man. See, at the core is, is, is the first and the greatest issue. The church so desires to be like the ungodly, ungodly culture. They look at the world's idolatry and they say, wow, that is cool. And in contrast, Paul is sickened. I want us to think about this for a second. Just little application here. What, what's your reaction? What's our reaction? Do we look at the things of this world? Do we look at some TV shows and you know they're worldly and you know they have nothing to do with the Lord and we say, oh, this is great. I like this. What's your reaction to the idolatry that is seen all around us? How does your spirit react? For Paul, it stirred him to provoke anger in him. See, the real issue here is a heart issue. You know, and if you think about it, really, there are so many warnings in Scripture about worldliness. Just a couple, really quick. We're all familiar with James 4, right? You, the adulterers and adulteress, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Oh, it's pretty hard-hitting, don't you think? See, sometimes we hear these scriptures that are powerful, and they're simple and clear, and we know there's no mistake of what they mean. And something in us says, yeah, but what I'm doing really isn't like that. The Bible tells us these things, that the fleshly, worldly things, listen to this, because here, here's, here's the argument, right? Well, yeah, of course, Athens was given over to idolatry. They were actually building temples to these deities, and they were worshiping them, and they were worshiping them in the worst ways. Here, yeah, there's some worldliness, but it's not really like we're, we're worshiping 
you know, deities. It's not like idolatry. Well, let's just see what Colossians 3, verse 5 says. It says, Mortify therefore your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. There's that list, and what does it say? Which is idolatry. All of those things are idolatry. I know some people say, well, just the covetousness. Okay, whether you think it's just covetousness or that whole list, it's idolatry. You know why? Because the God of your life is you. The God of your life is your fleshly desires. People are willing to listen to a song that is filled with fornication because they like the beat. Fleshly desire. Some Christians are willing to watch the movie because of the action and the amazing special effects, even though they curse the name of the Lord. Fleshly desire. Some are willing to compromise their faith in a multitude of ways for monetary gain. Fleshly desires. But God warns us in such clear and powerful ways in Scripture. Think about this. Listen to Ephesians 5. Uh, I'm going to read verses 3 through 11, so if you want to turn there, go ahead. Ephesians 5. 3 through 11, and I want to read this slow because this really pertains to what we're talking about here. You might be familiar with the book of Ephesians, especially Ephesians 5. We all love it. But in proper context, let's read verses 3 through 11. It says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, there it is again, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's pretty clear. That should make us all tremble. Every one of us tremble. Because here's the reality. Every one of us are either attacked by these things in our lives, are, are challenged by these things in our lives, it should make us tremble. And then it goes on to say, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Again, something that should give us pause. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's your mandate. There's your marching instructions. Walk as children of light. Just don't say it's so. Walk as children of light. Walk to reflect the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them but rather expose them. But at the core is your heart. When your heart is truly converted, you desire the righteous things, not the idolatrous, idolatrous things. Because we know that there is power in salvation. See, this is the thing. We downplay salvation on so many levels. We say that, well, salvation is, is a choice of man. If he has enough faith to believe, or somehow intellectually he comes to some kind of understanding that he could choose God on his own. See, you, what you've done when you say that, and that it's not the sovereignty of the Lord that saves you, you just took salvation and you took it out from being a miracle and you took it to being an act of man. And with that, there is no power in it. But the Bible tells us because salvation is actually a miraculous work of God himself in your life to quicken you and make you understand the truth of where you stand and you lead you into repentance and gives you the faith to believe. Not, it, not only is that a miracle, but guess what that, what that miracle comes? Not only God's power to save, but po God's power to live. God's power to live. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly in this present world. There's power in true salvation. 
So how do we see Jesus laid his life down for the church. Think about this for a second. The church is his. It is his bride. It is a beautiful bride. It, it is a precious bride to him so much that he was willing to come out of the glory of heaven and to live like a man, to put on human flesh and, and walk this world and die for you. Die for his church. Take the wrath from God himself for his church. See, the church is to be a beautiful virgin. That, that's the picture. It, it, it's, it's to be pristine. It, it, it's to be without blemish. It's precious to Christ. How do we see the church? How do you see one another? The church is to reflect the radiance of the Lord Jesus Christ in his character. And he has created the office of pastors and elders to help shepherd the church, to teach the word that it would be cleansed and that it would be made complete. And instead, there have been men, not in this church, but in other churches, especially where we live today, who have come in and they've taken this beautiful, precious bride and they're saying that it's not precious to anyone. What should we do? Let's put lipstick on her. Let's dress her like a harlot and parade her around. Let's bring in the worldly music. Let's have the singers gyrate up on stage and do all these worldly things. Do you see what they're doing? They're taking what's precious to the Lord and dragging it through the mud. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if these people could ever claim ignorance when they meet Jesus and they will be judged for that. It's a fearful thing to think about. So what does Paul do when he is stirred? Does he curse them and move on to the next city? No, listen to the very next verse. Verse 17, he says, Therefore, Disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. His anger turns to what? Compassion. Do you see it? He, he doesn't just leave them alone and say, fine. Go off it with your idolatry. He preaches the gospel. The most loving thing you could do, just know this, the absolute most loving thing you could do in this world is give someone the gospel. Do you believe it? Paul's anger is turned to compassion for all the lost souls around him. He goes to the synagogue, to the Jews, to the Hellenistic people, and he and he's preaching Jesus Christ. He goes into the market, not just once, but what does it say? Daily. You see his, his devotion to these people, to his God, to give them the truth. Faithfully preaching to a world that is steeped in idolatry, to a world that is ignorant, even through pride in all their culture, because Paul knew that these people were headed to destruction, and the only thing he could ever, that could ever save him was Jesus Christ. So again, we must stop here. It isn't enough to be sickened by the culture because of its idolatry, but does your disdain for the wickedness around you move you to compassion for souls? It's easy to be mad. It's easy to say, oh, I hate that stuff, and walk away. But that's not why you are here. That's not why any of us are here. And, you know, if you think about it, right, are you a true Christ follower? The answer is amen. 
I would, I would say. If so, we must follow our Lord. When Jesus saw the ignorance of the unbelieving world around him, what does the Bible tell us? That he was moved to compassion. Matthew 9, 36 through 38 tells us, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the, the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Are you a laborer? Are you sent by the Lord Jesus Christ? We all are. We all are. And we see Paul's anger turn to compassion. And even though he was in Athens to wait for Silas and Timothy and took refuge there, he cannot help but preach the truth of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul also knew as a believer it was what he was called to do. And thirdly, we know that he could not have ever done it in his own strength, or either can we. You know, honestly, when we were uh, outreach yesterday in the park, you know, we were giving out tracks and talking to people, and there was these four young people that were sitting on this bench. And I've got to tell you, they're there, and they're smoking marijuana, they're cussing, they're foul. One girl looked like she was a harlot the way she was dressed. She was falling all out of her clothes and everything else. And, and it's easy to look at that and say, no. But see, what should happen is we should be moved to compassion. And, and God gives us the strength, even in the midst of their idolatry and what they were saying and how they were talking and what they were doing. We're able to give the gospel message. And they listened. They listened for a while, praise God, to that, right? But, but we must, we must look for opportunities all the time in the culture that we live in. Don't think about going here, Asia, Africa, Rome, all these other places. Right here in our midst, there's idolatry. There's people who are perishing who need the gospel. What is really interesting to me and exposes many Christians that don't study God's word is that this passage gets so twisted often. Some will say this passage shows that Paul immersed himself in the culture and was well read about all the, the pagan idolatry around him. And that's why he, he was able to go to the Areopagus and, 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 and be listened to. I'll tell you right now, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous especially as we read on and how he used a monument of this unknown God. People say, oh, see, he knew all about the culture there. Paul is angered, not studying, okay? He observes, but he is angered about what he sees. And he's moved to compassion to preach the gospel in the market daily. He's not meddling the things of what he believes in their culture. He's not partaking in their godly practices. He's being a light, He's giving the truth. He's preaching a clear and powerful gospel. I've heard multiple sermons about Paul and his intellect for studying pagan culture and being able to relate to them and, and, and give them, you know, uh, somehow make it about Jesus and change and stuff. You can't. That narrative doesn't work here, I'm sorry, with the context of what we have here. You know what Paul tells us uh, tells us when he writes to the church in Corinth? And, and by the way, Corinth is where he's going next. Okay, After Athens, he's going to Corinth. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. Does this sound like a man who's immersing himself in the culture around him and trying to like take the things out of the culture and kind of have this wisdom to give him a, 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 you know, a voice? Listen to what he says. He says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency, excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, where I determined not to know anything among you. Did you get that? Except save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in what? The power of God. Do you understand that? This is what Paul was all about all the time. All the time. To think Paul was preaching Christ on the down low just to be adapting to the culture, to have a voice. See, it's amazing. So you have all these like Christian artists, right, who, who say, you know what, we're going to kind of keep Christ on the down low, and I'm going to become popular in the culture today, and my music is going to sound like the culture, my movies that I make are going to be like the culture, and then when I'm accepted, then, then will I have prominence, and then will I be able to speak to them about Jesus Christ? That's blasphemy. Why? Because, again, it's a man-centered gospel and a man-centered power to reach people. Do you get that? What, what we're saying when we say that is that I need to do something to be intellectual enough, to, to be talented enough, to be widely received by the world. That's not the means that God uses. We only need to read the Word, and we get the answers. And if there's any question on exactly what Paul was confronting this pagan ungodly culture with, all we have to do is read the very next verse. Verse 18 of Acts 17, it says, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. What is Paul preaching in the synagogues and in the marketplace daily? Jesus in the resurrection. Be clear on that. To preach Jesus is to preach the reason Jesus came to this earth. How he went to the cross for our sins. How he suffered the wrath of God in our place. And his righteousness was credited to our account. This is what he's preaching and how Jesus rose from the dead and was resurrected because without the resurrection, what? Your faith is in vain because there is no hope. The resurrection was proof that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And now we can have assurance that our faith, like I said, is not in vain. And that we can truly have confidence through the atoning work on the cross that we are reconciled to God. I'll tell you, this is what Paul is preaching. Jesus Christ and his resurrection. What a message of hope. What a message of good news in the midst of arrogant people uh, who, who are, are worshiping false gods made by human hands. Just think about that. How much confidence can you have in your God that you actually made by your own hands you erected this statue, you made the temple that it sits in, and it doesn't really talk and it really doesn't move, but that's what you're putting your hope in. But that's never good enough, is it? Because we've got to make another God. And we've got to make another God and another God. See, Paul's message is simple, clean, and pure. It's the message of good news. You know, Paul, in the wickedness of the culture, was angered, moved to compassion, and preaches the truth. The only thing that we that could save a person, right? Uh, you know, there's two prominent schools of philosophy, it's what we find here too, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And they were in, interested in what they saw as when Paul is preaching and they get report of it or they're observing it, right? I think they're actually observing it too, as the new doctrine that, that they could possibly include in their multitude of gods. And verse 18 tells us, Then certain philosophers of the Epicure Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? You know, you could hear the arrogance in their words. You know, some were referring to him as a babbler. You know, and, and that doesn't mean that, you know, he spoke a lot. That's actually a, a, a slang word or a description for an empty talker who doesn't have any real substance to his words. He's just a babbler. And others describe him as one who spoke about a God that they never heard of. Either way, these, 
arrogant philosophers who thought highly of their knowledge were inquisitive enough to want to hear more. And quickly, I just I, I want to go through a little bit of this. In, in verses 19 through 21, it says, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And here they take Paul unto the Areopagus, which is a place where the most skillful of the top of the philosophers could hear him speak and so that they could examine him, so that he could, they could judge what he's saying. And, and this was a place of, called Mars Hill, which was an esteemed place of tribute to the god of Mars. Paul was brought not to be tried in a legal manner, obviously, right? But only as an inquiry was made about his doctrine. And they wanted their curiosity gratified. Interesting, also, it tells that people would come here to the area Areopagus because the Athenians and strangers which, were, were, which there spent their time and nothing else, and what? To either to tell or to hear some new thing. This is what the pagan world always desires, to hear something new. And, and the reason is because why? Why are they always grasping for something new? Because they don't have the truth. See, once you have the truth, you need nothing else. They have no assurance. They have no hope. They're always reaching for something new to satisfy their conscience. And in contrast is the gospel, which, like I said, is so simple and pure. It speaks to the heart of all men, not just the wise or the intellectuals. You know, our faith doesn't have secret levels that we have to get to, to something to grasp something new. It really amazes me. Even Christians think that walking with the Lord, you know, in a deeper way means somehow unlocking more secret truths. Paul would write in Colossians 2, and when we studied this book, we kind of went over this, but in Colossians 2, verse 6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We are complete in Christ. Christ is it. The knowledge of Christ is everything. There is no next level of wisdom that we must obtain. If you have received Christ, you have received everything you need to be faithful. You know, you don't need to walk a labyrinth or, or practice some Eastern meditation to empty your mind to get to another level. You need not to discover some hidden Bible code. So ridiculous what we find in the church sometimes. Or, or practice Lectio Divina, where you randomly pick any word that you see in the Bible and just start chanting it over and over, and somehow that clears your mind and you get some deep-rooted understanding. No, Christ has done it all for you. There's nothing else but Christ. Do we need to read the word? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit make us alive, make the word alive to us? Yes. Do we grow in sanctification? Yes. But honestly, there's no other hidden thing that we need to know. You know, Christian bookstores are filled with books, how to discover, how to uncover, or, or how to, some new thing to make you more spiritual. I, I kid you not, I've even seen a devotion which was called, What Does the Star Wars Universe Tell Us About God? Are you kidding me? The whole idea is from paganism, not God. We must run from that. So the stage is now set. Paul has the most influential minds of all Athens before him. 
they are all ears and they want to hear him. What will Paul say? Will he try to reach them on their own level? Will he try to engage them intellectually? Will he compliment them and, and, and their culture and not try to ruffle their feathers? How is Paul going to proceed in this? You know, think about this. What if you were given a stage before all the professors of Harvard and Oxford, and they're all around you, these top-minded professors that the world so greatly esteems, and they want to hear what you say? What are you going to say? What is Paul going to say? Look at verse 22. Listen how Paul starts this off. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Paul doesn't hold any punches. He goes straight after their arrogance and calls out their superstition. This is one thing that all pagans have in common is superstition. Irrational beliefs that have no basis in truth or reality. He's basically telling them, you reverence gods that are not even real. You're too superstitious. Your religious belief system has no grounding in truth. Wow, it doesn't sound like someone who's just trying to get to know their culture and kind of sneak Jesus in, does it? See how he changes that? He's now teaching them. He, he, he's, he's, he's not in fear of their intellect, of these great philosophers. He goes on in verse 23 and he says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions. What happened when Paul passed by and beheld their devotions? Do we remember? He was stirred with anger. He couldn't stand it. It was an assault on the, the one and true God. And, and, and he says, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye, listen to this, ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. It's not that Paul had to research who this, uh, this unknown God was. Paul is using that as, as a place to dive off into. That's all he's saying. And he's saying, you ignorantly worship because you don't know him. You don't truly know anything about this. You know what the pagans used to do? Because they were fearful of these man-made gods. How, how ignorant is that? They made these gods, these idols. They put them in these temples, and they were fearful of them. And so what they did is... Just to hedge their bets, they would create temples to the unknown God in case that God ever showed up and got mad at them. Hey, where's my temple? You see how ignorant that is? They could say, hey, there it is. Yeah, that's you, right? And here is where many will point to as Paul studying the culture around him and trying to use it as a way to bring in truth a little at a time. Is that what really what we see? No, absolutely not. Remember, when Paul observed the whole city, he was angered, and he wasn't studying their culture. He wasn't thinking of ingenious ways to somehow incorporate the gospel. Now, so Paul's first point is, listen to this uh, really quick. we got a little bit of time here. So Paul's first point as he speaks to these people is that you are ignorant, and I'm going to give you the truth. That's basically what he said in these first two verses that we see here. And, and because all men are religious and have a desire to worship something, that is true even in our culture today, right? Even as someone who says they're an atheist, you know what they're worshiping? They say logic, they say science, really they're worshiping rebellion and self. But, but we see that man has to worship someone. So externally, what do we know about God? God has given a witness about himself through what? Through what he has created, right? Right? It says in the Bible, in Psalm 19, what? That the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Right? And internally, according to Romans 1.19, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God hath showed it unto them. They have an innate sense of the true God of the Bible. His standards are written on their hearts and their conscience hold themselves accountable. Why, why do you think that we don't see people, if they truly don't believe in God, why are they not running around and just raping anybody they see? 
or stealing or people do do that. But why isn't the whole people who, everybody who claims to be an atheist, because it's written in their conscience and on their heart, the truth of who God is and his character. But because of sin, what? They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They willingly reject what they know to be true and choose to worship in ignorance. And this was the case here, and this is where Paul is going to go. And Paul is now going to, not only does he tell them, hey, you worship in ignorance, I'm going to tell you who God is. He now tells them and describes it. Look at, look at this with me in, in verses 24 through 29. I just want to show you this really quick. Number one, he tells them that God is the creator of all things. Look at, look at the first part of verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein. In Paul's day and ours, the truth makes no room for men's opinion regarding the creation. As we were talking in the park yesterday, and, and these people who weren't believing God, you know, you could always get them and say, hey, see that building over there? Did it just happen? No, you know, someone built it and everything else. Yeah, well, you know, the body's more intricate, the creation, the ecosystem, much more in uh, intricate. How can you say that there is not a creator or a God? Well, I guess you have a point there. See, people don't even think, right? So the creation for someone who knows nothing about God is a place where Paul starts and where we should too. In Paul's day and ours. And number two, listen to the rest of verse 24. He talks about God is the ruler. He says, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. It logically flows that if God is the creator, he is also what? The rightful ruler of what he has created. And this is what Paul, see, Paul is giving them, you know, theology 101. He's introducing to them to the only one true God. And if he is the creator and ruler, he doesn't live in some temple that man has built with his own hands. Number three, he tells them that God needs nothing from man. See, all the pagan gods needed man. They needed to be sculpted. They needed a temple to be built. They needed to be worshipped in a certain way and all these things. And what does he say? Look, at Paul's going to say that he is self-existing, self-sufficient, and complete in his own self. In verse 25, he says, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. See, their whole system was we create the God that we worship. What he's saying is, you don't create the true God. The true God creates you. And he doesn't even need you. And fourthly, in verse 26, he talks about how God controls all things. And it says in verse 26, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God's sovereignty. In, 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 in all men, and that he created all men, that, that there's no distinction, there's one blood, one race, really. The statement must have blown away their national pride, right? Why? Because the Greeks thought that they were the highest nationality that there was. Everybody else was what? Barbarians, right? They were the Greeks, right? And he tells them, God controls the affairs and destinies of all men and nations. And then fifthly, in verses 27 through 29, he says that God is the revealer. Listen to this. He says that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Men should seek the Lord because he's not far from each one of them, and he will make himself known to those he chooses. God being creator, ruler, self-sufficient, controller of all things, clearly re re reveals himself. Also in Romans 1, what do we find in verse 20? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
never ever get caught up into some argument with someone who says, there are so many religions, how can you tell that Christianity is the true one? There aren't many religions. There's truth and falsehood. That's all there is. That's all there is. And the only reason that people are denying who God is because they could clearly understand who God is through the creation and they're without excuse is rebellion. After Paul telling they are ignorant to the one and only true God and then explaining to them who God is, lastly, Paul is now going to tell them what God has said. See, if, if, if once you explain who the true God is to someone, right, it needs to be followed up with a demand on someone's life. You can't just say, yes, I understand now who, who God is, the true God. That's fine. Okay, see you. No, you can't walk away because if there is one true God, you better listen to what he says. And this is where Paul is going. In verse 13, 31, it says here, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth what? All men everywhere to do what? To repent. To repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. You know what? One thing that I don't know why in, in Christianity today, we need to really you, go to this. You know what our proof is of Jesus Christ exists? It was definitely proof back then. What? His resurrection. The tomb is empty. There is no body. He's alive. All the pagan idolatry and all the world leaders, they're all dead. No one listens to them. Jesus is alive. There's no body. Our God is alive and he's ruling right now. Paul's message ends with this simple but powerful point. What? Repent or be judged. Repent or be judged. You say, well, that's, that's kind of a hard message. The truth is hard sometimes. We need to warn people. In the past, God was patient, but a day is coming when he will judge the world through Jesus Christ alone. God gave sufficient proof of the truth of his word in the resurrection of his son. He holds all men accountable to that evidence. That's what Paul is saying, that all men are held accountable to the fact that Jesus resurrected. You know, John MacArthur puts it this way, and I like this. He says, his grace in the past and his wrath in the future require repentance in the present. I like that. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say about himself? The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Do what? Repent ye and believe the gospel. And that message isn't popular today, but then again, it's never been popular this was Paul's message to them. And it must be our message today. There is no other message. There is no other way for a man to be saved. Now I want to just quickly, verses 32 and 33, because I'm going to finish. So what was their response to Paul's message? It says, And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Some mocked. Some were somewhat interested to hear him again. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll consider it and, you know, kind of indifferent, right? So did Paul's message in front of these so-called intellectual giants bomb? Should he have been more clever? Should he have more, studied more of what they believed and kind of used that more? Should he have been more accepting of their culture to gain some notoriety among them, to have a stronger voice in their opinion? Nope. Paul spoke the truth. And because he did, we have verse 34. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. Among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Paul's message was effective to save those who God chose to save. And that's it. And that's the lesson for us. 
Paul was faithful to proclaim the truth, and he left the results to God. And so should we. Lord, we thank you for this time in your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would just bless it, Lord. Oh, Lord, you are good. I feel like I can't even adequately scratch the surface of your truths found in your word, Lord, but I pray that your Holy Spirit would make your word alive to each one of us, Lord, that you would deal with our hearts, Lord, that we would have a desire for truth, that we would have a desire for righteousness and want to live according to your word. Lord, we do live in an idolatrous culture. It surrounds us, Lord. Oh, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't want it. We wouldn't like it. That we would be angered by it. But also, just as Paul, just as our Lord was, that we would be moved to compassion. That we would be dedicated to be faithful to you, to give the gospel that saves souls, Lord. And I pray that you would save many as we seek to be faithful. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.